Welcome back to the second part of episode three in our Zig programming language course. In the first part of this episode, we discussed how RAM works and how data is stored and transforming from numbers and characters that humans understand into the zeros and ones that machines comprehend. We left off last time at data types, so let's continue our exciting exploration. As we mentioned earlier, there are many data types, but ultimately, they are all stored in almost the same way. The main difference between each type lies in how our functions and programs interpret those values. Another key difference is the size of the data. For example, in the previous segment, we introduced the different numeric types, such as integer, and explained the difference between unsigned integer and signed integer. We saw how the unsigned type takes advantage of the space allocated for negative numbers and replaces them with more positive values. This allows for storage storing more values, effectively offering a larger storage capacity. As shown in this table, each unsigned type can store double the value of its signed counterpart. We have eight integer types, divided into four unsigned and four signed. The smallest of these types is eight bits in size, which means it occupies one byte, enough to store values ranging from zero to 255. However, when we move on to the 16-bit type, we notice that it stores a much larger value than expected. For instance, the U8 type occupies eight bits in memory, whereas the U16 type takes up 16 bits in memory. This means that the space is doubled, not simply added. To illustrate the difference, if we add 8 bits containing 255 with another 8 bits containing 255, we would get 510. But if we double these bits to the power of 2, we find that with each new bit added to the sequence, the previous value is doubled. This means that with each bit increase, we can store much larger data in relatively smaller spaces. Now, let's try something a bit different to encourage you to explore the official Zig documentation and not just watch the videos. Let's visit the official Zig website and check the documentation. On the left, you'll see a list of topics for easy navigation. At the top, there are different versions available, and the documentation might vary between versions. Make sure to select the version you're working with. In my case, the latest version is 0.13.0. So this is the documentation I'm following. From the list, what we're most interested in right now is the primitive type section. You'll notice that these types are derived from values, which directly relates to today's topic, data. Looking at all these types, you can begin to understand the significance of data types, especially when you realize that many of them are essentially just aliases or special names. For instance, we have 10 distinct integer types here, divided into signed and unsigned categories, ranging from 8-bit to 128-bit. However, just below that, you'll notice types like I-size and U-size. These aren't entirely new types, but rather aliases used to represent specific contexts. In most cases, they are just referring to one of the the 10 main integer types, typically the largest one. But let's not get too distracted by these technicalities, as each of these aliases has its own purpose, which might seem a bit complex at first. However, for now, just keep in mind that we have 10 signed and unsigned integer types that can handle most of the data you'll work with in the future. But wait, what if we wanted an integer type with a custom size? For instance, we have an 8-bit signed type and a 16-bit signed type. But what if we need a type with exactly 10 bits? Well, if we scroll down a bit further in the documentation, we will find this note which says, in addition to the integer types above, arbitrary bit width integers can be referenced by using an identifier of I or U followed by digits. For example, the identifier I7 refers to a signed 7-bit integer. The maximum allowed bit width of an integer type is 65,535. In other words, Zig allows you to create custom-sized integer types, both signed and unsigned, simply by changing the number after the I or U prefix. So, for example, you can declare an I10 for a signed 10-bit integer, or a U7 for an unsigned 7-bit integer, and so on. This gives you a lot of flexibility when it comes to defining exactly how much memory you want your integers to take up. Okay, I think we've gone through a lot and a lot of pretty deep information, especially if this is your first time being exposed to these terms and these things in general. So let's take a break from the theoretical learning and move to a live session where I'll share my screen with you. We can do some hands-on activities to understand better. So let's get started. First, I'll create a new folder, and inside that folder, I'll create my main .zig file. Then, I'll open it in my code editor, which is Visual Studio Code, just like we learned in the first lesson. Now, let's write the main function, and don't forget to make it public so that the code works correctly without errors during compilation. Next, let's try to create a variable. We'll type var, which is short for variable, followed by the variable name, and then assign it a value. Now, let's pause here for a moment. As we look at the screen, we see a strange term appearing, comptime integer. What is that, and why does it show up? 
Well, in the code editor, there are additional features beyond just allowing us to write code. For example, there's a feature called IntelliSense, which is essentially an intelligent code suggestion tool. IntelliSense provides helpful suggestions and highlights potential errors as you type, making it easier to spot issues before even running your code. For instance, IntelliSense can autocomplete function names, suggest variable names based on existing definitions, and even highlight syntax errors or unused variables in real time. This feature also attempts to understand the code contextually, showing useful hints like expected parameters types or the return type of a function. When you hover over a piece of code, IntelliSense provides a tooltip with documentation or type information, which can be incredibly helpful for exploring new code and improving efficiency. For our ZIG program, IntelliSense detects that we haven't specified a data type, and it infers a COMTEAM integer type based on our initial assignment. This hint indicates that the value is a constant known at compile time. If we were to declare a more complex expression or use the variable in multiple places, IntelliSense would adapt its suggestions to reflect those changes. This kind of assistance means that the editor can help us write cleaner, more accurate code, giving us a more efficient coding experience. Now we almost understand why these terms are showing up, but wait, what is this comp time integer type? Well, the term comp time refers to compile time, which is the phase when your code is transformed into an executable program. Essentially, a comp time integer is a value that is known and fixed at this stage, meaning it won't change during the program's execution. This is significant because it allows the ZIG compiler to optimize our code. When a value is known at compile time, the compiler can make better decisions about memory usage, performance, and potential errors, resulting in more efficient execution of our programs. Now let's try a new way of learning, which is by analyzing the codes and understanding how they work and discovering abnormal or undesirable behaviors and interpreting each case for a deeper understanding of the science. In this example, we have a constant and we have a main function, and inside it, we are trying to add one to the constant above. But in the other example, we have the same code, but instead of a constant, we have a variable. Which do you think is correct? Exactly. The variable is correct because we tried to change its value by adding one after we declared it. But if the value is constant, meaning it cannot be changed, a compile error will occur indicating that constant values cannot be changed after they are declared at all. Now in this other example, we have a variable and a main function. And inside this function, we are trying to add one to this variable. But don't you notice something strange in this code? I will give you five seconds to think. Well, considering the data type used while declaring this variable, it is unsigned 8 bits integer, meaning it cannot hold values more than 255, and considering the value given to it when declaring it, it is indeed the maximum value of 255. And looking inside the main function, we find that we are trying to add one to a place that is already full. And here, what is called overflow occurs. So what does overflow mean here? In simple terms, because an unsigned 8-bit integer type can only represent numbers between 0 and 255, adding 1 to 255 wraps the value back around to 0 instead of moving to 256. This behavior is built into the way memory and data types work at a low level. Now, why does this matter? Overflow can introduce critical bugs in real-world applications. Imagine a program that tracks scores, counters, or measurements using an 8-bit integer. If it's not carefully monitored, an overflow could reset set values unexpectedly, causing incorrect data or unexpected behavior in the program. To avoid overflow errors, programmers often use larger data types. For instance, a 16-bit unsigned integer can store values up to 65,535. Or even better, we can add range checks or error handling mechanisms to prevent overflow. Many languages, including Zig, allow you to catch overflow scenarios during development to prevent unexpected results in production. Now in this example, we have several constants with different values, and we are required to find out which constant has the wrong value. You have five seconds to think. Well, all these constants contain wrong values, and therefore in this code, we have approximately five compile time errors, indicating that the expected storage capacity for each data type for each constant has been exceeded, and thus what is called overflow occurs as we mentioned earlier. But looking at this example, we will find that we are using a different data type in all the constants, which is compiling time integer data type. In this code, we will not encounter compile time errors because this type does not consume a real value in memory. Therefore, it is not stored, but is replaced by the value directly during the compilation of the code. In other words, it can be considered as an easy way to contain or remember some constant values that we may need in our codes to facilitate reading, maintaining, and writing codes in general.
Now, I think it's time to end this part. I think we will produce more parts related to the third episode because this chapter is long and needs to be studied and understood deeply and correctly. I also want to extend my greetings and thanks to the only supporter of this channel, which is Space. Every time we publish an episode, this person donates as an encouragement for us to continue. I appreciate this kind of support as it really makes us develop faster. Also, don't forget to tell me your opinion about this part and the upcoming parts as they are still under development and all opinions are welcome. Thank you for listening and see you in the next part.